It's a passage where the Buddha is recommending breath meditation to the monks. And one of the monks says, hey, I'm already doing breath meditation. And the Buddha asks him, well, what kind of breath meditation are you doing? And the monk says, I suppress any sensual desires for the past, any sensual desires for the future. And suppressing any sense of irritation with the present, I breathe in, I breathe out. In other words, he's practicing equanimity. Whatever comes up, he's going to be equanimous to it, and he's not going to try to move for any pleasure, any sensual pleasure in the memory of the sensual pleasure of the past or anticipation of sensual pleasure for the future. And the Buddha's response is interesting. He says, well, there is that kind of breath meditation, but that's not how you get the most out of breath meditation. Then he teaches the, what you might call the Buddha's 16-step program. And you look at the first few steps and you realize he's going in a very different direction. Instead of just being very passive and allowing whatever's going to happen to happen, he's got a program. There's an agenda in mind. First though, he starts out with a simple exercise of being aware of the breath when it's long, being a aware of when the breath is short, as a given. But then the third step, he starts using a new phrase. He says, training myself, or training yourself to breathe in, aware of the whole body, being aware of the whole body as you breathe out. In other words, you're not just letting things happen. You're training things in a specific direction. Now, this has to do with the Buddhist teachings on experience as a whole. He says you can classify your experience into five aggregates form, feeling, perception, fabrications, and consciousness. He says you never really experience these things in a raw form, the mind works them over. There's an intention behind your experience of each of these things. And this is the element that he's trying to get to. If you just watch things arising and passing away, say, well, I'm just sitting here passively arising, watching the arising, watching the passing away, you're closing off the mind to the fact that it's adjusting things behind the scenes. And this habit of ignoring a part of what you're doing in the present moment is the habit the Buddha is trying to get, get at, because so many attempts to gain awakening do just that. They close, close off large areas of your awareness and say, well, I'm letting go of X. And when then you've let go of X, you think you've accomplished something. But in the meantime, you've been holding on to Y. But the holding on to why is underground. It's in the blind spot of your mind. And so what the Buddha is trying to do is get you aware of those blind spots, aware of what you're doing. So he calls your attention to the fact he has you training yourself to do something in the present moment, so you get more and more sensitive to exactly what you are doing in the present. So after having you aware of the whole body as you breathe in, aware of the whole body as you breathe out, you'll begin to notice simply the fact of making yourself aware of the whole body is going to change your, your breath. You start seeing that the breath is a whole body process, and parts of the body that you allow to be uncomfortable as you breathe in or as you breathe out, you're not going to want to allow them to be uncomfortable anymore. This leads to the next step, which is calming bodily fabrication, i.e. the patterns of tension that you send through the body, the intentional side of the breathing process. You want to calm those things down, i.e. work through them, 
find ways of breathing that allow the whole body to breathe in a way that's together. There's a sense of the whole body breathing in together and no parts are fighting against other parts. And you've just alerted yourself to something, that there were parts of your body that you were totally ignoring, things that you were holding on to that you don't have to. And that right there is probably one of the most important lessons in the meditation, is to look all around. This is why the whole body awareness is something you really want to work on. Because the more fully you're aware of the whole body, the more fully you're going to be aware of your whole mind. If you're just aware of one point, there's a huge area for greed, anger, and delusion, and all kinds of other things going on in the present to hide. And even just the simple act of fabricating things in the present, whether it's innocent or not, is going to stay in the background and you won't get to see it. This is why you hear so many cases of people who claim awakening, having followed a certain set menu of what they should be doing. And they pass the tests, whatever tests their teacher set for them, got transmission or whatever, but then they still go out and behave in really unskillful ways. It's because they haven't really learned how to look at what they're doing, the decisions they're making, the choices they're making, the intentions they have in the present moment. So this is why you want to become as sensitive to the whole body as you can. And then if you sense any unnecessary tension in the in-breath, unnecessary tension in the out-breath, allow it to relax. And you can ex start exploring different ways of making the breath more comfortable. This is why John Lee has that as one of his steps. To see what ways of breathing calm that bodily fabrication so the breath feels comfortable all the way in, all the way out. And this leads up to the next steps, being sensitive to rapture or refreshment which is probably a better translation of the Pali word bitti. Breathe in with a sense of refreshment. Breathe out with a sense of refreshment. And this is how you get there, by being aware of the whole body, by calming the way the breath comes in, calming the way the breath goes out. This allows for a sense of fullness. It's almost as if every cell in your body is allowed to have its space and to fill up that space all the way down to the tips of your toes, all the way down to the tips of your fingers, through all the muscles of your head, through all the muscles of the back of your head, down the back of your neck. All the parts of the body that you tend to ignore, allow all of them to have their space so they're not squeezed with the out-breath or not pressured with the in-breath. The more there's a sense of the connectedness of the breath energy throughout the body, the less pressure you have to apply. It's almost as if you allow all the pores of your skin to open up and everybody gets to breathe. Everybody gets to have a part of the breath. This also leads to a sense of ease. Now, sometimes that sense of refreshment or fullness can get too intense, which is why the next step is to become sensitive to not only the feelings but also to the perceptions. These are called mental fabrications. Become sensitive to what these are doing in the process of the breath, how your perception of the breath, how your perception of what's going on as the body breathes in and breathes out affects the actual experience of the breath. Maybe you can change the perception. One perception I found useful is one that John Fuhr recommended. He said there's kind of a, a line of breath energy running down the middle of your body. And when the breath comes in, it comes up to nourish that line. And when it goes out, it goes out of that line. 
So it's not just like you're trying to pull the breath in through the nostrils, but the breath is coming in from every direction to fill up that line in the middle. And you want to make sure that line doesn't get squeezed out even as you breathe out. Keep that full so that whatever breath energy is helpful stays in the body. And only the breath energies that seem excessive or unpleasant at the moment, they can go. Another perception you might have is that the body is a big sponge with all the holes in the sponge connected so that when you breathe in one part of the body, it can connect to any other part of the body. Or you can find what other, uh, other perceptions help to keep the breath as calm, to keep that sense of ease in the body as calm as possible. Because that's the next step, is to calm down these metal fabrications, i.e. the feelings and the perceptions. And to eventually arise at this perception of the whole body just being filled with breath energy. And it gets more and more still. Ultimately, you can actually reach the point where the sense of the in and out breath stops. There's just breath energy filling the body, and it's sufficient. The mind is still. What's happening is that you're using less and less oxygen in the brain, so your need for in and out breathing gets reduced. And the oxygen coming in and out of the pores is, is enough to keep you going. The next step, the Buddha says, is just to train yourself being aware of the mind as you breathe in breathe out. This is where your focus shifts a little bit. You're still with the breath. And just as you were aware of the feelings that related to the breath in steps five through eight, now you're aware of how the mind relates to the breath, the state of the mind. You just learn how to watch that. Learn what states of mind help the breath, what states of mind are harmful to the breath, and also learn what ways of breathing are helpful to the mind and which ones are not. You want to see the relationship between these two things, because it helps get your thinking even more in terms of cause and effect, as how what's going on in the mind affects your experience of something as basic as this, the breath coming in, the breath going out. Because that's where you're going to start getting insight in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And then in the next three steps involve noticing when the mind feels out of balance, there are different ways you can get it back in. What ways of thinking help steady the mind? If you find that the mind is a little bit wobbly on the breath, what can you do to steady it? In other words, here you're trying to master the various states of concentration. It's not enough just to get into concentration once, or get into concentration only when you've got your eyes closed. You want to see what you can do with the breath to balance the mind in any situation. When you're out walking around, when you're driving, when you're shopping, sitting at the computer, dealing with difficult people. What can you, can you do to keep your mind steady so it doesn't go straying off into unfortunate and unskillful areas? And this may relate to where you focus on the, the breath energy in the body, how consistently you can focus on it, what ways of thinking, what values you have that remind you that this is really important. If somebody's yelling at you, don't go out and sort of eat up what they're yelling at you. Stay inside the body. This involves not only breathing techniques, but also your whole set of values of what's important in life, how you can deal with situations skillfully. And a similar, similar principle with the other two steps, learning how to gladden the mind when it's feeling down, or when its energy level is low, how do you bring it up? And then when you feel it burdened with various things. How do you 
release the mind from the senses of burdens. This can be gross burdens like the hindrances or more subtle ones, like when you've got the mind in a state of concentration where you're thinking about and evaluating the breath, how can you let go of the thinking and evaluating so you can just be one with the breath? That's a kind of release. Or how, when the states of rapture start feeling oppressive, how can you let go of those? That's another kind of release, all the way up through the different levels of concentration. What you're doing here is learning how to master the concentration so that you can use it in any situation. Keep the mind balanced, satisfied, gladdened, steady, and with a sense of freedom. And it's then that you're ready for the steps that deal more in terms of insight. Which are the last four? The first is keeping track of inconstancy. Just making up your mind, you've got to watch the inconstancy of the breath, the inconstancy of the mind, the inconstancy of whatever comes up. Even when your state of concentration feels relatively solid, in what ways is it still inconstant? I try to get the mind as concentrated as possible, as still as possible, and then watch it to see is there still any movement in here. And it'll take a while to start noticing that. There's a wavering, there's an unsteadiness, even in really good, solid concentration, because after all, it is a fabricated thing. And what you're trying to do is see how the mind fabricates, and this is the ideal laboratory for it. Because you're watching it with as little interference as possible. And when you really see that inconstancy, then you see the other two themes, which are the stress that's in the inconstancy and then the fact that if it's inconstant and stressful, it can't be yours. So the next step is breathing in and out with a sense of dispassion, and then just watching the dispassion. for the process of fabrication. Again, it's not that there are things out there that you're watching and becoming dispassionate for. You're becoming dispassionate for the activity that you've been doing all along, of fabricating things, which you've learned how to see because you were consciously fabricating. But now you begin to realize that no matter how skillfully you fabricate things, still it can only go so far. And when you feel dispassionate for these activities, that's how they cease, because it was your passion for them, your desire to keep at them that kept them going. So you watch their cessation as you breathe in, as you breathe out. Then the last stage is relinquishment, when you give up everything, not just the things that you are fabricating, but even the insights you gained into these things. And you give up even your attachment to this experience of the deathless that comes as a result. The suttas where the Buddha points out that if you have an experience of the deathless, it is possible to kind of latch on to that and develop a, a passion for it, a sense of becoming that builds up around that. And that's what separates the lower levels of awakening from the higher ones. And again, if you're not alert to what you're doing in the present moment, you're not going to see that. If you haven't had practice from the very beginning, noticing how you shape even your breath, or how you shape your feelings, how you shape your perceptions, there's no way you're going to see how you get attached to what seems unconditioned. And so you're bound to latch onto it, just as another kind of attachment. But if you've been sens sensitized to how you shape the present moment. You're going to see it at some point, and then totally let go, 
relinquish even that. And that's when there's full awakening. So those are the Buddha's 16 steps. It's not just a matter of simply allowing whatever is going to arise to arise and allow it to pass away. You consciously develop states of concentration. It's an intentional form of becoming, so that you can see the process of becoming in action. So you can let go of the different kinds of clinging that underlie it, and you've got an all-around awareness of what those forms of clinging are. In getting the mind into concentration, you've got to let go of clinging to sensuality, but that leaves the other three. Clinging to views, clinging to habits, and cling to ideas of yourself. And you'll see cases where people let go of a particular habit, but they're ho holding on to some pretty strong views. Even when they try to let go of their sense of their selves, they mis may still hold on to particular habits and strong views. So what the Buddha is teaching you is to have an all-around sense of how you create a sense of becoming. And how views and habits and a sense of yourself play a part in creating in those states. And now it's, it's necessary to refine your views and your habits and your sense of self in order to get the mind into concentration. And then when they've done the work, that's when you let them go. If you try to abandon everything from the beginning, one, it short circuits the path, and two, what happens is a lot of things you thought you abandoned just go into the back rooms of your mind, or they go behind the curtain, and they pull the levers and push the buttons behind the curtain, but you have no idea that they're there because you've been ignoring their existence. So the purpose of this is to have an all-around awareness. So that no matter what's going on in the mind, you see it. No matter where there's clinging, you can be aware of it. And it's only when you're aware of it that you can let it go. Mm -hmm.